chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, pull up one of those Burgundy Bibles. We're going to be on page, um, what is it, page 791, where we're going to be this morning. You know, have you ever, you ever get nostalgic about the past? You know, you kind of look at the past and you kind of think, man, look how great things were. A few years ago, we were in uh, the great state of Texas, my, actually the great nation of Texas, we were there. And uh, that's right. And uh, that's where I grew up. We were in my hometown. And uh, my kids are now old enough where uh, I could take them to some of the places, you know, dad's old stomping grounds. So one of the places we went, my little hometown is a little place called Ovilla, Texas, not very big. Uh, just outside of Dallas, about 20 miles, and I wanted to take my kids to the old ball yard, right? The old ballpark where the Ovilla Little League happened, and Dad was a star, right? Not not really, not truly, uh, but I did swing left-handed, and everybody thought that was cool because uh, that was odd in our day. Uh, I did have a Pete Rose signed wooden bat that I thought was the coolest thing in the world that I bought from like some store that was really cool, and I took my kids there, and I was telling them all about the concession stand where they fed us, they gave us snow cones if you brought a foul ball. You could get any kind, you know, rainbows, blue, you know, cherry, all these different kinds. The barbecue grills, just, you know, smoke rising up where you can smell the hot dogs, you know. And then the lights of this place, just seemed like in, in the summer, would just light up the Texas sky and it just feel like we were playing in a big league ballpark, right? I mean, and, you know, we were probably only eight right? And the field just seemed huge and the whole thing. And we drive up to the place and it is an absolute dump. It's a dump. And I'm, and I'm trying the best I can to have my kids visualize their dad starring in the Ovilla Little League. And they're just like, yeah, this place is a dump, man. I mean, Nathan's like, we got better fields than Roseburg. I'm like, watch yourself, son. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of it. We'll figure this out quickly. And it, there's just something of that nostalgia. Just It kind of ticked me off. How dare they let my ball yard go down, right? And we all do that. You ever notice how, how things just seem better? And when you kind of go to them, you can't get people to visualize it. Uh, This week, I was just thinking about Roseburg, you know, this beautiful little town we live in. And it's funny to me, um, my uh, elder board is two-thirds, if you take the the three of them, two-thirds of them have lived here all their lives. So I asked one of their wives, what made Roseburg, Roseburg? And it was classic. She just said, oh, man, downtown Roseburg, you go to Woolworths and the soda fountain. It's like, you just arrived, you know what I mean? Wow. I mean, they, and this shocked me. They would go to Miller's because it had the only elevator in town. And he's just like, I mean, look at these people. Yeah, man. Was, yeah. You know, I mean, it was just amazing to me to hear these stories. And then she said, and Roseburg just isn't the same without, without the pine drive-in. Just not the same. I said, where was that? Well, New Life is. I'm like, well, hey, man, be a cool drive-in. The Tog. What in the world was a tog? She said, that's where all the cool kids hung out. And I said, oh, I know you hung out there, didn't you? You know, the tog. I mean, the good old days just seem better, don't they? They seem better. And, you know, and to be honest with you, we're a mixed generational crowd here. And those of us that are older are going, yeah, man. Those of us who are younger are going, what are you talking about? I mean, we just kind of flippantly throw it off. But here's the question I want to ask. What if it's true? What if the good old days were better? What if they were? What what if your marriage, which started off so wonderful, now after 15, 20 years, 30 years, has lost its zeal? What if what happens when your spiritual life, which you went into with full gusto and you look back and you saw people coming to Christ, people being discipled, and now you look at your life 15, 20 years and you're just like, ugh. What happens when things that were in the past were actually better? Well, the passage that we're going to read this morning is about a group of people who are experiencing that very thing. 
These 6th century B.C. Jews had returned from Babylon almost 20 years prior to this letter or this prophecy or these messages being given to them. Some of them were older people. They had returned to, to Jerusalem from Babylon and they remembered the glory of Israel, Jerusalem. They remembered the beauty of the temple. They remembered its sparkling beauty and the way the city just was a buzz when it came to Passover and festival time. They had returned from their Babylonian captivity with great hopes of rebuilding that temple to its original glory. But years had gone by and nothing had been done. So discouraged, scared, and consumed with their own personal comforts and interests, they have been aroused to get to work by Haggai the prophet. So here they are, about a month and a half after chapter 1 has been spoken, and, they're going, and Haggai is going to bring them another word from the Lord. They, they have now got to work, and they're about a month and a half into this work. So let's stand together, and let's read Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotiel, a governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, O ye people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we do get nostalgic. We do look back and there's so many things of our past and things of our own church life or spiritual life or married life or national life that we grieve, that we've lost. I pray, Father, this morning that you would not only speak to us about our responsibility, but Lord, you would speak to us as well about your great work. And I pray as well, Lord, that we would see that the glory of this temple has come. And his name is Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here's what I hope that we'll see today. I hope that we'll see this, that God promise to be with us and he will strengthen us and empower us as we work doing things that seem mundane but are greater than what our minds can conceive because God will not fail us. He will not fail us. I hope you notice the question in verse 3 after this after all the introductions of this word coming verse 3 and here's the question Is there any of you who are here in Jerusalem right now that remember the temple when it was in its glory? What do you see now? Is it not as nothing to you? In other words, isn't this awful? Isn't this pitiful what you see now, this unbuilt, unfinished temple when you remember the glory days? Isn't it awful when you... Look at it and you compare the current state of affairs to what it used to be. Aren't the current state of affairs, don't they seem like nothing? See, let's, let's be 
honest as we get started here, this is how many of us feel about our nation, isn't it? Those of you who have fought in wars, you've been around the block a few times in this world, you hurt and you ache for days gone by of honor and chivalry and truly America being the land of opportunity. You, you, you miss those days. The, the current days in America seem to you like nothing compared to what they were in the past, don't they? This is where many of us go with regards to our church life. Now, I will be honest with you, that's not what goes on here. Most churches in, that I've been a part of struggle with these kind of things. You'll hear people long for days gone by, when it was easy to get around, when, when we knew everybody, and we knew exactly what was happening every moment of the day. We were involved in every little decision that might have been made. People will remember their church being one where, kind of like the old Cheers song, where everybody knows your name and you can go in and everybody knows you. And this is something we hear about, that you could finally find a church directory easily. You know, you knew that. It was something you could get your hands on. Some would say our former pastor was better. Some would say our old singing was better. Some would say our old relationships were better. And it just goes on and on and on. The, 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 the nostalgia as we think to the past. Sometimes we look back and things that were truly glorious or things that were truly beautiful and powerful, and we compare it to the current state of affairs. The current state of affairs seems so small. They seem so worthless, don't they? I mean, you compare some of the old toys of the past with the toys my kids bring home today, and that plastic garbage they get home bring here today is just awful. It's comparatively, it's as nothing. Now you take that to grander scales, and you begin to realize when you compare, it gets discouraging, and it can get remarkably frustrating. The message that we get from Haggai is something unique because what, what Haggai begins to say to these people from the Lord is he says to them, I want you to remember the glory days. I want you to look back and remember what those glory days were about, but not to get nostalgic and dreamy. So we have a tendency to do that, don't we? I mean, if you get any chance sometime, and I would encourage you to do this, we'll talk more about this in the upcoming weeks, Get with somebody who is older than you and just hear your story. Have dinner with them, get with them, and after dinner, what you're going to begin to find is you'll hear them talk about their life. And you'll hear them talk about days gone by. And within a short moment, you can almost kind of see them go off into another land. It's like foreign. We're sitting around our elder uh, community table as we have dinner together and hearing the stories of them. And I can just see a couple of them. They just go, I remember the days when you could just drive by and honk and people just wave, you know. And, you know, now you honk and people go, you know, like running off there. And they just kind of drive, they kind of go off into this land. And I always think it's a little house in the prairie, you know. They kind of go on to the little house in the prairie land. It's like, well, wow, that sounds really nice and fun. We, 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 don't, we don't live there. Now we live here. Hello, listen to it. But there's something about that nostalgia that we go into. That's not what Haggai's asking us to do. He's not telling us to look at things and say, boy, things were so much better when he's actually encouraging them to put their hands to work because God is with them in their work. And what we see, we see this in verse 4 with the command. There is a command in the text that we cannot miss. And the command is this, be strong and work. Now you can imagine, if you are thinking about the history of these people, you can imagine the fear. The enemies around them have told them to stop. They have threatened them. The king himself at one point had sent an edict and a letter out to tell them they need to stop. You can imagine the frustration in them. Where are they going to get the money to build the temple? Where are they going to get the supplies to do what they need to do? Where, who's going to protect them from the onslaught of their adversaries? 
You can also imagine, because we've all been there, of the longing and the dreaming and the missing of days gone by. Can't you imagine that 70-year-old man who walks by the temple day after day to go get fresh fruit from the market or a little bit of meat from the market, passing by that temple, and every day just kind of going, ugh. This isn't the way it used to be. Can't you imagine him remembering the temple and its glory? The procession of the priests. The, the, the great festivals. The blaring trumpets. The wonderful music. The, the seriousness and sobriety of the Passover festival combined with celebratory singing when that sacrifice was finally made. Not to mention the beauty of that old temple. I mean, the gold, the exquisite woodwork and carvings were everywhere. And to go with with that, that every child that might have walked in there, you can imagine these old men and women now walking by this feudal place remembers when they were a young lad or a young girl walking by and their eyes getting big when they saw the stone and all the stuff around it in its glory. It would just take their breath away, but now that they walk by it, and it's in shambles. I mean, we can imagine how absolutely disheartening that must have been. Yet, I want you to notice what Haggai does. He doesn't mince words, does he? He gives them a command. Be strong. Get to work. And notice verse 4, there is no one exempt. The governor, the priest, and the people. Every person from leader to citizen who was able to work was to be strong and get to work. In other words, they were to take heart, be steadfast, be single-minded. Don't let anything stand in your way or sway you from finishing the temple of the Lord. Now, there's something here that I think we've got to just draw out of this as we start. We see this first command. When we see things not as they should be, not as God directed, we should heed the words we find in Haggai chapter 2, which is very clear. Be strong and get to work. And no one is exempt. So we have a tendency to say, well, I'll leave it to the big guns. I'll leave it to those who really know what they're talking about to get to work. I'll leave it to somebody else to deal with these issues that we see. But you'll notice in in verse 4, nobody's exempt. Nobody's exempt. The command is clear. Be strong and get to work. So, listen. Yes, you may look at your marriage and it does not have the fire that it used to. Lost a little bit of that zip. A little bit of passion, a little bit of romance, a little bit of time together. Life has just kind of taken you by the nose and drug you through the ringer, and now it's lost something. You know what a Godward response to that is? It's be strong and get to work on it. You might look at your nation and you say, it's not as it should be. It seems that politics are backwards and the morality of our nation is at, it is at a tipping point. I mean, everywhere you turn, it just feels like there's something new that you just say, really? We're going to go with that? That's going to be our new leader? Woo! Okay. Where are we going? Everything around us seems to say something doesn't feel right. Well, listen, a Godward response is to be strong and get to work. Your church relationships may not be like they used to be. You know, you just miss the good old days of when everybody just kind of knew everybody and you kind of just get together and these little meetings and everybody kind of knew who was there. Now you come to church, you don't even know half the people that are here. And it's a little frustration. They're hard to get to know. I don't know how to invest in that. I don't know where to get connected. Here's the challenge. A God response is to take heart and get to work. See, here's what we can do with our nostalgia. We can either moan days gone by 
Or we can put our hands to the plow and work. That, that's, that's our responses that we can have. But here's the challenge with what Haggai actually does for us. We're going to find this right in the Old Testament. Haggai gives us a, a thing we have to be really, really careful about with this be strong, get to work command. Anybody can do that. Are you aware of that? Anybody can do what he just said. Pick your stuff up by your bootstraps, barge in, and start making changes. Anybody can do that. Christian, non-Christian, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, anybody can do that. Politician, non-politician. Anybody can boom, get strong, be strong, and get to work. What does he say that is unique to the child of God. And you're going to find this in verses 4 and verse 5. And it's the promise of God in our work. It's a big difference. See, the Lord tells the people to work, be strong, because. So he says, I am with you. In other words, Take courage and work because the God of the universe is with you on your side and is present with you. The Persian king might have said to them to stop and might be against them, but they knew this. The God of the universe was with them. Their enemies might deride them, but God was with them. They were to work in their work and be strong in their work because the Lord was with them. See, th this is the normal language of God to his people. See, are you aware of this? It's a normal language of God in the Bible to his people. Virtually every time that God says, be strong and do something, he finishes it with, and lo, I'm with you always. Let me give you a few examples. Deuteronomy chapter 31, the people of Israel are getting ready to head into the promised land. He warns them they are going to encounter enormous opposition. And here's what we find, that God told them they would face this opposition, but be strong and courageous because the Lord is with them. What about Joshua? Joshua finally is getting ready to then get on the other side of the promised land. He is going to be the leader of this conquest. He's going to take Moses' role. Joshua's a little nervous about what that's going to look like. What does the Lord tell him? Joshua will be strong and of good courage because I will go with you. I will go before you. What about New Testament Christians? Jesus told us to go make disciples of all nations in Matthew chapter 28. Notice how he begins it. Notice how he ends it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore. In other words, go because all authority has been given to him. Look at the very last line. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. See, here's the point. God doesn't, doesn't just tell his people to, to get to be strong and work. He tells his people and us as his people to be strong, to go to work in him, with him, and for him. The difference between our work and the work of the rest of the world is this. God is uniquely with you and with us, and he is uniquely empowering you and us in our work. So you might think to yourself, you know, yeah, I hear you, man, listen. But this is for somebody else. You can't guarantee me that God is going to be with me in my work. You know, you might think to yourself, I'm not holy enough. I'm not good enough. 
I'm not high enough up the heavenly food chain. You know, I'm not an elder, not a deacon, not a missionary, not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I don't have particular skills. But notice what the text says that guarantees this promise will be fulfilled by God. You, you, can't, you can't miss this. If you catch anything in the sermon, catch this. And if you catch it and you need to leave, great. At least you caught this. But don't miss this, verse 5. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Now you might think those words don't really mean much. They mean an enormous amount biblically. This is life-altering news for the people that they're hearing this in Haggai. Here's why. How many people that you know of who heard Haggai's message were actual participants in the deliverance from Egypt? There's zero. You know why? Deliverance from Egypt is over a thousand years before this message was given. So how in the world does the prophet declare from the Lord, I'm going to be with you because I promise you through a covenant that I made back in Egypt that I'm going to be with you. Can't you imagine some little kid, 13-year-old punk, goes, hey, wait a minute, I wasn't there. What do you know? Can't you imagine some young bucks saying, wait a minute now, I've got all the intellectual capacity here. I was not there at that day. Therefore, that promise is not for me. That's not what the Lord says, is it? The Lord says, I'm going to treat you who are a thousand years removed from that covenant as if you had received that covenant. And here's why this is life-altering news. Everybody hear this. God, your God and their God, was and is what we call a covenant-keeping God. In other words, when he says, I will be with you because I made a covenant with you, Here's what that means. He will be with us because he made a covenant with us. See, that's what it means. It's not, it's not profound. It's not, you know, beyond something extraordinary. It is very normal and natural for God to make a promise, covenant to keep the promise, and God keep that promise. These people, just like us, had given themselves to their own pleasures and comforts. You remember the rebuke in chapter 1? How dare you live in your own comforts when the house of God is in shambles? Yet, here's what we see. God, in chapter 2, says to them that he is still with them because he is a covenant-keeping God, and his covenant does not change. The people in Haggai's time had the promise of what God did for their ancestors a thousand years ago. In Egypt, when he delivered them from slavery, he delivered them by the blood of a lamb, and it was a deliverance by the hand of the Lord. And in that deliverance, God promised his people, Israel, that I will be with you. My spirit will reside with you forever. We, as God's new covenant people, have the same promise. However, through a greater and more wonderful deliverance found in Jesus, the Son of God. Through Jesus, 
God delivered us from the slavery of sin. Through Jesus, he delivered us by his own precious blood. Through Jesus, God delivered us by his own hand. And through Jesus, God promised that he would be with his people. He would never forsake his people. And his spirit would always reside in his people. This means that God's covenant with his people does not change on the basis of his people's faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Now that is life-altering news. You can say amen to that. You can rejoice in that. You can do a little dance in the back if you need to. That's life-altering news. This means that we can take God at his word when he says, I will be with you, my spirit will remain with you, and he means it. Listen to Paul Tripp when he wrote these words. God not only forgives your sins and guarantees you a seat in eternity, but welcomes you to a radically new way of living. Now listen to this. This new way of living is not just about submitting to God's moral code. No, it is about God covenantally committing himself to be faithful to you forever, unleashing his wisdom, his power and grace for your eternal good. That, wow! This means that our strength, our courage is not ultimately dependent on our personal moral strength or mental fortitude. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? It is ultimately dependent on this. God keeping his word, which he said he will do. This means that your work and our work is not ultimately dependent on our personal wit, wisdom, strength, or wealth. It is dependent ultimately on God keeping his word, which he has promised to do. This means that God's presence with you, God's empowering spirit in you to do good in this world is not ultimately dependent on your faithfulness, your goodness, or your ability. It is ultimately dependent on God keeping his word, which he has promised he will do this means then as paul tripp also wrote that you can take your life off your shoulders because god has placed it on his so maybe this morning you're hearing these words and you know man you have cut short the work of God through your life and in your life. And you've gotten discouraged. You've given up. You've thrown your hands in the air. You get just ang violently angry about days gone by and how we are today and how it just messes everything up. And I would just ask a few questions of you. Are you resting and trusting in your ability or his? Do you trust God to fulfill his word to you and in you? Are you resting in his promise to be with you? Or are you anxious that he has forgot you somewhere? Just one of my little ones over there, just leave them to the side. I'll come back after I've dealt with the big people. Friends, listen, God didn't just promise. Oh, no, 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 no. 
No, God didn't just promise. He covenantally promised. And sent his son Jesus to seal it. You know what that means? That he guaranteed his promise to be done. And he seals it by his son living in our place perfectly. Dying in our place as our substitute. And the promise, the the guarantee that says... I approve of all that he did, and I seal it all in his life and his death is because he raised him from the dead. And that resurrection from the dead is his way of saying, hey, listen, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can put all your hope, all your trust, all your confidence in this fact that the covenant Faithful God will be faithful to give you courage and to empower your work as you get to work and as you're strong in the Lord. But you can guarantee this is a covenant-keeping God. That's the promise. Now you might ask, the, what, 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 to what end? What are we working for? Is it just to put money in our bank just to eventually have a nice, happy life for our children? What is the end result? Well, notice the end result in verses 7 through 9. These are some of the most prophetically powerful words in the Bible. I will shake all the heavens so that all so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fulfill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And then notice verse 9. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace. Can you imagine the encouragement that this gave to these people? Imagine that 70-year-old lady, you know, couple been hanging around the block a few times, and they're just battling. When are we going to finally see this thing? And he just says these words. Don't you think that suddenly they perked up? This is one of those, are you kidding me moments? R- really? That That's going to that's gonna happen? This is a word from the Lord that something's going to happen. I mean, these people, these words show them that their work was not in vain, but it was bigger than they could imagine. These words would show them that the adversaries that they're going to face would be worth it going through it because they know the latter glory of this house will be greater than the previous glory of this house. This means that every obstacle that might stand in their way would seem like a little pebble to them. Because the, the latter glory would be greater than, than this present glory. Now, we have the unusual ability that these people didn't have of 2,700 years of human history. So we now look back, and we know something about this particular time frame in human history. We know that they did rebuild the temple. And it was something to behold. As a matter of fact, when you read in the New Testament about the temple, that Jesus taught at and was around, it was this temple that they actually completed. It's remarkable news. And as they got to work, something happened. King Darius, who had now risen to the throne, began to do some research in Persia and realized, "Uh uh-oh, the king before me stopped the work they need to get back to work. And I want, you to, I want to read to you the letter that King Darius wrote to these people in the book of Haggai, or the book of Ezra. Here's what it says. 
from King Darius. Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding that what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house. Listen to this. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue. The tribute of the province from beyond the river and whatever is needed Bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests of Jerusalem require. Let that be given to them day by day without fail. That they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven. And pray for the life of the king and his sons. And do you see what God did here? See, God was doing, wasn't he? Something bigger than they could even imagine. They're terrified. They look at that temple and they think in their mind, there is no way it can ever be rebuilt. This is is nothing in our eyes. The word comes to them. The latter glory would be better than the the previous glory. They set their hands to work. One guy's just chipping stone every day. One lady's just bringing water to the workers. One one young kid has got that little thing on his head where he's dragging little things behind him. They're just doing things day after day after day, rebuilding this temple, thinking this mundane work is small and frail and weak. And look at what God is doing. Something way beyond what their minds could conceive. In their mind, there is no way God could restore this temple, much less restore it to be greater than what it was before. Greater than Solomon's temple? Are you crazy? Yet, what do we see? God. Their God and our God has covenantally promised to his people that he would be with us, that he would make us strong, and he would empower our work. So we say, what? He will surely do it. That's what you see here. He will surely do it. I mean, are, are you are you aware of this? Are you aware that he will surely do it? I mean, are you aware of that? Do you live that way? He, do you live with that expectation? He will surely do it. In his time, he will surely do it. Yes, again, your marriage isn't perfect. Never will be. Right? Go ahead and get that expectation out. Never will be. Your spouse will not become Jesus overnight. Let's all go there. Okay? Not going to happen. There will be difficulty. But listen, a Godward response is this. I want to be strong in the Lord. I want to get to work because you realize this. As I do this, be strong in the Lord, get to work, do what God's asked me to do, to love my spouse, submit to my spouse, care for my spouse, serve my spouse. I trust that God will produce the results that He designs. Knowing this, through my marriage and my pursuit of my spouse, I am revealing to the world, and God's revealing to the world, a Savior who came and pursued 
his bride. You see how big that is? Through you just taking your wife on a date. Through you working through marital challenges. See how big that is? God is doing something bigger than what your minds conceive in your mundane marriage. Yes, the relationships that you've had and you have had and you do have, some of them hurt and some of them are painful. You know what a God response does? It doesn't just, isn't just sorrowful over the loss of old friends. It's not. It's, it's to be strong in the Lord, get to work on reconciling what you can, and always leaving the door open for this. I will always be willing to restore as God allows. My marbles are always on the table. Whenever you want to come and play, I'm going to be sitting at this table waiting. A God response says, I'm going to recognize that God is doing something bigger because when I'm doing that, pursuing unreconciled friends, here's what God is doing. God is revealing the beauty of Him pursuing us who are His enemies to make us His friends. God is pursuing that and revealing that through your pursuit of unreconciled friends. Yes, listen. Our nation is in sins and Satan's crosshairs. No doubt about it. You watch it and you go, oh man, I just hear the discussion. I don't care what news channel you watch. It's still, you just kind of go, really? Are we talking about this? A Godward response is not just to get nostalgic about the good old days and get angry about what we've lost. That's not a Godward response. A Godward response is this. Be strong in the Lord. Get to work encouraging Christians, evangelizing the lost so that, listen, by a gospel heart transformation, people will begin to view life through a biblical worldview, not a sinful worldview. See, here's what we've got to get in our mind when we think about national stuff. Nations do not change simply by who's on the throne. Nations change by who's on the throne of the hearts of the people. So we can moan and bemoan all the things that have gone by, and we should have an ache for what went on. But that ache should remind us, wait, we have a God in heaven who is with us in this work to evangelize the lost, encourage Christians, and then go do what God's asked us to do in our neighborhoods, our families, our churches, our schools, our workplaces, wherever He has providentially placed us for His glory, knowing what? He's with us. He promised to be with us, and He promised to fulfill it and get it done to the end. That, that's, that's the beauty of what we have to see here. God is always doing something bigger than our minds can conceive. Always. He did it in Haggai's time, and He's doing it in ours. There's a dilemma, though, in Haggai 2 that we have to address. Because you have to ask a question. Where is that temple now? Big problem. If the latter glory is to be better than the previous glory, 
Well, let's think about the previous glory. What happened to it? Uh, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians to the point that it was recognizable. In AD 70, the Romans came in and destroyed this temple to the point that it was unrecognizable. So when you do some history, you begin to go, how is the glory greater than the previous? Sure, Jesus, and it was big and beautiful and nice. What happens here? Anytime you read Old Testament prophecy, you have to look for what's called dual fulfillments. Dual fulfillments are simply this. We have one of these in the text. We see, we see the people did finish the temple, didn't they? Yes, they did. We see that it did surpass the beauty and the wonder of Solomon's temple. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that temple, the disciples marveled at it. When you read Matthew 24 and Jesus talking about that temple, he's just saying to them, can you see how beautiful this place is? Jesus recognized the beauty of the place. It was glorious and it was truly the centerpiece of Israel's worship. But then the Romans came in, knocked it completely down. Do you see the problem? See the problem if we're going to look at this text in a biblical historical viewpoint? Well, look with me what Jesus said in John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, 19 through 22, Jesus says something about the temple. He said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. The Jews got very angry about this, did not recognize that Jesus was using that temple to speak of his own body, his own temple. So then after the resurrection, his disciples got it. Oh, it was his body, the temple that he was revealing. The temple, that physical temple, in all its glory, listen now, was intended to display, to not display its own glory, but was intended to display the glory of the Son of God, Jesus. When the temple was eventually destroyed in AD 70, some 40 years after Jesus had resurrected and ascended to the right hand of God, it was a sign from the Lord, listen now, that there was no longer a need for a physical temple on earth any longer displaying the glory of God. Why? Jesus had come and fulfilled it all. He came to say, I am the glory of God in human flesh. The temple's original glory was a, a beauty to display the glory of God, the way to God, the way to be accepted by God. All of that, every ounce of that was fulfilled in the life death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the temple was a shadow. It was a signpost pointing to Jesus. And so sad, isn't it, that the Pharisees who spent day after day missed that. They missed it. This means that the latter glory, what came after that temple, was indeed more glorious than the previous temple. When Jesus Christ comes and came, listen, He said very clearly, something greater than the temple is here. But that's not all. I mean, that's not, that's good, isn't it? That's not all. Because in the New Jerusalem, our heavenly city, notice what John wrote about the temple in that city. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. (laughs) I mean, is this any more clear? Friends, your temple. You're not waiting to build a house, a building block, physical building block that everybody goes, ah, see, that's where God resides. No, 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 no. No, he has already come and his name is Jesus. God is the centerpiece of our worship in the heavenly realm because Christ has come. The Old Testament temple was that the people of Haggai's day rebuilt. It fulfilled its purpose. It fulfilled it. It was rebuilt so that the Son of God could be revealed through it. And when its day was done, oh, was its day done. The Romans came and turned it upside down and said, no need anymore. Someone greater, something greater has come, and his name is Jesus. Now, here's here's what I want you to glean from this last point, this ultimate end result. I want you to glean this. Yes, we worry about our marriages, our families, our nation, and our church. Yes, we're concerned over building things that honor God, right? That's a rightful and an appropriate concern. So we're to be strong in the Lord and work with his strength in whatever capacity he's asked us to do. 
But, listen now, the ultimate end result is not so that your marriage, your family, your nation, or your church might become something special. That everybody says, oh, look how great they've got it. Look how wonderful that is. Look how joyful, look how friendly they are. Look how they do certain things. Now listen, the ultimate end result is that Jesus Christ might be exalted in our marriage, our family, our nation, and our church. That's the end result. And can I just tell you something? That end result is where God is at work. That end result is where God's at work. You might wonder, why does it feel like God is not working with me in my work? Could it be because you don't have the ultimate end result in mind? You just got one result in mind. I want my marriage to be good so I can be happy. I want my wife or my spouse to fulfill all of my needs so I don't have to look anywhere else. I want our nation to be great again so we can once again say, America the Great. So we can raise our flags with honor. Is that it? Is that it? Really? Is that what this nation was intended for? I say not. It was intended to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Revealing what? The glory and the wonder and the splendor of a Savior who has come. See, don't aim too low here. You can stop at the end result and go, oh, the gladder days will be greater than the first. And miss, and miss. No, there's an ultimate end. There's an ultimate end. And it's this, that Jesus Christ would be glorified. So here, here's the, the word, right? So let's be strong in the Lord and get to work. Go home today, love on your spouse and your children. Go to work tomorrow with a little bit different mindset that your work in that mundane fulfills something bigger in the corporate purposes of God. Go to church, engage with other Christians, en- encouraging them, challenging them, equipping them, strengthening them for a bigger work. Find those non-believers that you love and share the gospel with them. Doing what? Knowing that God is at work doing something bigger. And pray like crazy. Involve yourself to vote. All the different things that you can do as an American citizen in this nation for the glory of God. Not so that we can just have the right person in office. But so something ultimate will happen. Let's get to work in the Lord and be strong in Him. Let's pray. Father, we we so recognize our need this morning. Lord, I, I think of my own battles with fear of man and anxiety and fear and 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 my own pride or selfish ambition or the things that get in the way. And I just, Lord, I just want to repent of those. I just want those to be done away. And I know this for our church. Our people want the same thing in their lives. Or they want marriages that represent Jesus in this world. They want to go to church that represents Jesus in this world. They want to they live life underneath the banner of honor and glorifying Christ in every facet. Lord, you know that. And you, you are calling us to be strong in the Lord and get to work. There is an end that you're after. And it isn't just for our fulfillment on this earth and in this place the ultimate end you're after is that jesus christ might be glorified in all that we do and touch in a way that we find our fulfillment in that so father do that in us where we have stepped out of bounds lord deal with us where we've lost hope and just gotten angry lord would you would you just adjust us where we need to get to work in the strength that you provide and in the fruit that you provide, would you help us? We are ultimately yours and you have promised covenantally to be with us and to let your spirit abide in us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.